Okay, so hello, Miles. Hello. So today we're going to do a little bit different interview with you and focus on you as a vocalist. Cool. So are you ready I'm, to I'm roll? I'm so ready. I'm ready to rock. Let's do this. So actually the first question goes that do you recall when you heard rock music for the first time? Yes, I do. As far as rock music goes, it would have been, I was probably five years old. I was getting out of daycare. My mom was working, so she put me in like a daycare thing during the day. And uh, she picked me up and I heard, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, I heard smoke on the water. And I just thought, that's cool. Yeah, that was my first like introduction into the power of the guitar riff. So was that also the point where you decided that I will be a musician one day, or how did that actually happen for you? No, I think that point happened probably eight years later when I heard Eruption by Eddie Van Halen, and then a few hours later I heard Whole Lot of Love. That was the afternoon that changed my life. I remember it very, very well. It was like the sky opened up, and the hand of God just was like, <laughs> you know, it was inc- it was just incredible. Yeah. So was it like the guitar that got you like yes. interested about music? Ironically, it was the it was it was all I was all about guitar. I didn't. I, the only the, I did like vocal melodies. Like I was definitely drawn like you know melodies so primal. So I was definitely drawn to like Beatles melodies. You know anything that was well composed. Um, yeah, I definitely had a thing for. It. So you also went to Spoken Falls Community College to study music. Yeah. So how did that happen? Well, I really wanted to go to Berkeley or I wanted to go to the Musicians Institute. But truth be told, just didn't have the funds to do something like that. So something, I forget what happened. Something happened. Somebody from the community college, like they heard me play. And so I got a little bit of a scholarship. And I remember when I got that news, I was like, oh, cool. You know, that would... That would make it so that um, you know I could I could do this, and uh, so I and I'm glad I did because it just so happened that at the time their staff was really great. Like I I got into the perfect window. Like my guitar teacher Joe Brash, amazing guitar teacher. My um, my theory teacher Mr. Halverson, amazing. And my second year I got to study big band arranging with a guy named Bob Kernow. So I, and that guy is like, you know, a legend. It worked with like, I believe worked like Stan Kenton and, and like just a, just a, a legendary uh, arranger. So for me, having that foundation in jazz studies, uh, I've, it was just incredibly, very great way to kind of set me up and prepare me for my journey. So was like Cosmic Dust your like first proper band ever or cosmic dust you know what's funny about cosmic dust is those were basically my teachers okay in the at the school i was in proper bands prior to that and during that like originally you know, like cover bands and then we turned into like original bands so that those were like the, the bands where i was putting in a lot of time i had a band called bittersweet bittersweet turned to widow's party a b- bunch of high school bands and whatnot cosmic dust was just they were like my teachers i looked up to them and they're like hey you know we think you could you want to come out and, pl- and play with us, which was being, it was a huge honor for a student to be asked by their teachers. But like that record that, that, that is kind of floating around, that was just recorded in a weekend. You know, it wasn't like a, it was just, there was, it was all live. And it's funny how years later that, that record is, has kind of this, <laughs> had this life. But in reality, that was just a, one of the many gigs I, I did kind of hustling. You know, I play on Sunday nights with them, and but then I had other bands during the week, and yeah, I was playing in multiple. It's kind of like now. I have, I had, I even had multiple <laughs> bands back then. At one point, I was in five different bands at the same time. So, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a, I'm kind of loose when it comes to my, <laughs> when it comes to how many bands I play in. Uh, was that like the first proper release that you did, or did you also release something with the previous bands? It was one of the first, like that first like real release. It might have, it was either it was either that one or a band a band called Citizen Swing. So that and that was the first like real record deal that I had, and it was a you know it was a small independent label, but they funded this record. The thing about that was that was my first experience really learning to become a writer, 
Okay. And I didn't know stylistically what I wanted to do. And then you can hear that in those some of the some of those recordings where it's like, I, he, he does he want to be Stevie Wonder? Does he want to be you know Sly and the Family Stone? There's some little bit of rock in there. I was just trying to figure it all out, but I was really lucky that there was a label that was willing to give me a shot. Now, what's interesting is the the, the guy who kind of helped get that whole thing rolling was a guy named Joe Close, and he was Dion Warwick's like musical director, and he just so happened to live in Spokane. But I did I was hired to do a session that he was producing, and then he's like, hey, you know, he had a friend uh, Carolyn, who you know they got to talking, and were like we should try and get this guy, get him a you know a shot. And I'm forever grateful. I don't talk about that enough, frankly, because that was kind of what got me going into becoming a, you know, a writer and learning how to write. So was Citizen Swing the first band that you started singing in? Yeah, I believe that. Like, the first band, like, my own material. So I, I sang occasionally, like, in cover bands. Like, I'd sing backup vocals and then may, maybe do a lead here and there. But I didn't want to be a singer. I really didn't. I just did, I just wanted to step back and play guitar. A fair amount of the cover bands I was playing in, they had a great female singer, Lisa Lisa Olson. She was she was a great singer. So I would, but I would occasionally sing a song here or there and sing backup. One thing that was interesting though is that there was a band. We had a like a. This was after I graduated from that school. So this is this is a long time. It was like 1990. First gig, <laughs> two weeks out of school, and we get this. I get this great gig with this. Once again, some some of the I think one of the teachers was was part of that band. So I'm like kind of hanging in the deep end, like with legit cats. And, um, but it was great because we were doing a lot of, we'd do a jazz set. And then for the next three or four hours, we'd do like R&B tunes. But what that did for me is it really provided this foundation for me vocally. Because we, what I was doing was doing a lot of the harmonies to these R&B tunes. And these were high, and females, keep in mind, Lisa's singing the lead. So I'm half in harm, and like some, we were doing like Whitney Houston, and like, yeah, so it's difficult high, stuff. Yeah, difficult. Yeah. And so what it forced me to do was develop my falsetto really early, and and really start to look at the range, you know, getting up, getting up there. That was a, that was really beneficial, in a lot of ways. So what kind of like early memories do you have when it comes to the singing, and and did it take like long time to have the right technique for it, so oh. that you wouldn't lose your voice doing those falsetto stuff? Well, I was young, right? Yeah. So when you're young, you full, can get away. Full on. Yeah, you can do. You know, you can just go and go and go. So I and I hadn't really done any studying. I didn't understand how to. I just did it. Just opened my mouth and, you know, it did what it did what it did. It wasn't until about five years later, some, somewhere around there, and uh, after I got the first real like major label deal, and I was lucky enough with the Mayfield Four and the management at the time, Silver Management, they suggested that you know I study with who a few you know one of their artists had studied with it. Chris Cornell had you know they had they managed Soundgarden, and uh, you should study with Ron Ron Anderson, probably. Like as far as things in my career, like that were so pivotal in kind of where things would go, was having that opportunity for him. Because that he's one of the greatest teachers in the world. Period. And he's since passed away, but I'm forever in debt to the to the things I learned from him. So he threw a hand. I didn't take a ton of lessons from him because, frankly, I couldn't. He was he was expensive. <laughs> yeah, like I couldn't. I couldn't afford a ton. Like some guys would just have him come out and play, do every show with them and warm him up. And for me, I, I probably took a total, after, like, 15 years off and on. I probably took about 15, 16 lessons from him. But I still work with those, those uh, recordings. Anytime I'm getting ready to sing, I warm up with them. So yeah, that's where that was when my first introduction to t- learning technique came into being. And they wanted me to do that because they knew I was going to be touring a lot. And they knew, you know, when a rock singer touring nonstop you, you gotta have an understanding of what not to do so you don't blow your voice out when you started singing we've asked this same question from like different metal vocalists but where you first sort of like mimicking your idols before figuring your own way how to do things or how did you develop the voice that you have today absolutely i was mimicking for a long time because i just didn't i didn't know who i was yet When I first started singing was in that Citizen Swing era, right? And I was, was kind of, it was kind of a reaction to 
what was happening where I lived in the Pacific Northwest because grunge was king. Okay. So I was like, well, what, are, what is it that I'm going to do? And what is it? What, are, what, are, what is it we going to bring? What, you know, they've already, they're already doing that. So I was, I loved, you know, my first musical memory. There's the rock question, which is a great question, by the way. But my first musical memory was seeing Stevie Wonder on Sesame Street. So Stevie Wonder was kind of the, the thing and always was. So I would sit and drive and listen to songs in the key of life and Stevie Wonder's mu- original music aquarium, which was like a greatest hits thing. And I would sing along, try and sing along. So I was mimicking Stevie Wonder a lot initially. Then fast forward a few years later, and then I heard Grace. I heard Jeff Buckley. And it was just like, okay, I mean, that's, what is that? What's happening there? Tom York, Radiohead, same same thing. It took a long time of just kind of like, and you can hear that then with the Mayfield Four, like that first Mayfield Four record, you can totally hear, you know, his his inspiration. <laughs> um, but that's very normal in the early days for every musician sure. that you hear those influences through. Sure, yeah. So, but I was trying, I was trying to figure out who I was, and it took about another decade or so till I was like, oh, okay, I think that's where I'm going. I'll do that. <laughs> In terms of like heading out for the first tours, were you ready as a vocalist to do like show after show after show, or was it like a big learning experience also for you? Well, it was in the beginning, like especially touring like on a national level, we were the opening band, so Mayfield was. We don't have to play like half hour. I, I was able to get away with murder in that <laughs> sense because you're only doing like five or six songs. If we'd have been straight out of the gate doing being the headliner. It would have been tough, and I so I where I really had to learn was when I joined Alter Bridge, and that's when it was like okay, and that's where I learned things like if you're going to go for the high note at the end to find the real, that was a, a song on on the first record, but it was super high, and uh, you can definitely hear like the Chris Cornell influence at that point. Doing that night after night was af- affecting things, you know, and I so I had to figure out. I just go back to Ron like Ron, do you have any suggestions here? And he would teach me to reapproach it and. And that was kind of the saving grace. I don't know what I'd have done not having, you know, that guy to help direct me. And he's, a, you know, he's worked with a lot. Of, he worked with a lot of people. He worked with he worked with M Shadows, um, who I just I love his voice. Um, I mean, we could just go on and on and on. Or Ax, Axl Rose, David Coverdale, like Chris Cornell. Just a what a gift he was to the music community. Were there like some specific warm-up routines for you that you followed back in the early days, and how has those changed through the years, or have they remained the same? Well, that's a that's a good question because initially I would do those sessions that I did with Ron, which were usually about forty-five to fifty minutes long, and I would do the entire thing before a show. Okay. And that would not realizing that you're already kind of wearing your voice out, and it wasn't until I had a I had a tour manager. Pete Merluzzi, shout out, brother. Pete was like, he would hear me just warming up obsessively before it was when I started playing with Slash and Conspirators. And and he's like, you know, Miles, have you ever thought that maybe you're kind of burning your voice out before the show? I was like, oh, yeah. You're so smart, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I changed it. I, I, edit, I edit, What I started doing was... If, if I would go up, if there's a, an arpeggio, um, set, you know, a set of, of arpeggios or you know, scale, I would just go to the top with it, and then I would stop and so instead you, of coming so back down. So you're sort of seeing where the voice is, and yes. then if it's there, it's exactly fine. It's fine, and I would so now. And now, if if the voice feels good, I generally it's about nine minutes that I'll do. Uh, and there's one particular lesson where I'll just do the first nine minutes of it. If the voice is feeling a little weird and I feel like it needs to open up a little more about 15 minutes and then I'll try and get up in my upper register and get that passage I believe you know where you're passing between your chest voice and your head voice and get that to to bridge a little better and I but I can even just tell just by talking how like right now if you were to say sing from your and I'd be like eh because I'm my one of my issues especially traveling is I'm I have real issues with like dust mites so if okay. I stay in a hotel and there's a lot of dust or if it's kind of humid and there's like a mold and all, like I have all these allergy issues and it'll change it'll I can feel the swelling in my vocal folds like it literally it's a, a physiologic I can I can tell what's going on my voice will get a little it sounds a little froggy and then I know it's going to be trickier getting into my upper register until that swelling goes down so yeah I've just been doing it for so long and I I think I know my instrument so well where 
unfortunately. With that comes a little bit of anxiety because it's like, oh, here we go. Like I've got an acoustic, I know I've got some acoustic stuff to do tomorrow. And I'm like, oh boy, you know, is, is, she, is my voice going to work for me? Is it, are the vocal folds going to be, uh, you know, a little too, a little too swollen? But that's part of, the, part of the fun. You just never know. But that's never good that if you are like stressed out, I guess that's also quite bad for a vocalist. It's, it is bad. It, 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 it kind of compounds the issue because the, it's just like with anything in, in life, which kind of leads to shameless plug, leads to the, the, you know, the, this album title, this record I have coming out called The Art of Letting Go. But it's, that, it's learning to let go and not obsess and let that, you know, attach to those thoughts, attach to that what if oh no you know it's because then all you're doing is you're just making it worse that's not going to do any any good you just got to relax and everything at the end of the day it's you want that effortless you want it just to be go you want to be in that flow state fair enough my next question is going to be that are there like some specific foods or drinks that you try to avoid before the show that you have felt that they harm your singing somehow or on the opposite side something that you want to take that you have felt that they help you with the singing Well, the interesting... This is the album topic, really. Yeah, question. right? <laughs> the thing with me is, I mean, I... Uh, man, I'm kind of cursed on a number of levels in that respect. I have a really... My digestive system is not the most hearty. So, like, spices, no go. Even though I love I love hot foods, I can't do it. Carbonated beverages, absolutely not. Because okay. um, it'll keep, you know, coming up. No al- alcohols, no. No, 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 no. No dairy... So generally what I eat, and I'll try to eat three to four hours before the show, is fish, maybe chicken, but super bland. No spices, not, not a lot of salt or anything. I'll have some rice and uh, some sort of vegetable and not a big portion. Because if I eat a big portion, then, you know, bloating and, you know, re- you know come up and that'll mess everything up. It took me a long time to figure that out. Especially traveling in parts of the world where the food's really good, and like I had a real tough time. <laughs> you know, I love like when we go to um, South America and, and Mexico, and I, you know, I love the spicy foods, and, <laughs> and I would eat too much at catering. And but I'm 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 just having to learn that anything that I do that tastes great while I'm sitting there at the in the catering that's going to make me have trouble during the show. It's just not worth it. I want I want the people to get a decent show if possible. The next question is going to be quite wide since okay. you've been involved with many different bands, but are there like some specific albums that you can pinpoint from your discography where you have felt that you've taken big step forward as a vocalist? Or do you feel that basically each album is a step on its own? You know, I didn't... In, in some ways, I almost would wish I could re-record a lot of my record, you know, the records I've been a part of, because I can't, and that's part of the reason I can't listen to them. Because I was do there were some, there were some things. The big, the a big thing that was happening is I had this deviated septum thing, and I had I kept getting these sinus infections. And I think you're gonna, you're gonna watch this and be like, man, this guy has a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm a little bit of a fragile flower. I'll admit that. But it, it was forcing me to sing like real kind of use my mask too much, and I and it, and it was in the timbre wasn't always. I, I, I would do it differently now, and I, so finally I met this this doctor and he fixed it and when I was, it was probably about 2015 so anything after 2015 I started to feel like a change start to happen and really by I think like Year of the Tiger my first solo record it was like okay this is more the sound I'm trying to achieve now that the infections aren't there all the time and I'm not you know it's I feel like the timbre is a little better it's opened it up and I almost didn't go through the surgery but I remember I was with Ron and I, you know I part of the reason I want to take a, a few few more lessons with him was just to get his opinion it's like man this is a big deal if you're messing with my instrument going there and opening it up so he had me do i forget what he had me do that would that would kind of test whether whether the surgery because you could do something i don't know if it was nasal strips or something which would kind of mimic the sound after the surgery and we came we both came to the conclusion like yeah you should definitely do that it's going to make a big improvement and it did it just kind of freed me in a number of ways so i wish i would have had that done decades ago so now you are like in three different projects if you count obviously a solo project as as its own do you have like different approach to vocals with each band or like solo stuff you yeah. are involved with? initially um especially between alter bridge and slash and the conspirators there's a very big difference with slash 
integrating more of my blues influence. With Alter Bridge, it was more kind of soaring, using, uh, you know, longer, uh, just the phrasing was, was a little different. But I got to be honest with you, as time has gone on, it's all kind of blurring together now, where it's just like, this is just who I am, this is how I sing. I try not to overthink it, I try not to compartmentalize too much in that respect, because I feel like, um, I don't know, it just feels right now. It just feels, I just let it, just let it flow. So the upcoming solo album of yours, the third one, The Art of Letting Go, will be released on 11th of October. So are there like vocally any new things or new approach that you have taken? No, I think, but I do think what I started to integrate on Year of the Tiger that I'm continuing on is I prefer the vocals to be in a little lower register okay. with the solo stuff. You know, for a long time I was known as being a, like more of a tenor and the, the, you know, the guy who sings higher. Yep. But... I think my natural, like, when I first started singing, I was using my lower register more, you know, and I, as time went on, it was just a lot of it was just out of necessity. You're playing in loud bands, and you're trying to cut through the, the guitar, so you start singing higher. For me, I, I, using my, my lower register more, I just, I don't know, I feel like I can express the same, just as much emotion in that part of my register, and it, to me, it's, a, it's just a timbre that I sometimes prefer, but... At the same time, still having the high stuff come in and kind of punctuate things. It's the same way I look at my guitar playing, like when I'm playing leads, where I don't, I don't like playing fast just for the sake of playing fast. I prefer to play melodic and have some emotion, but I like to punctuate and occasionally like throw in a flurry of notes and go, oh, okay. And it's the same thing now with, with, with the vocal, where it's like, oh, but I'm going to go for this note here just to, you know, it's kind of a cherry on top on this section, you know. So if it serves the song yes. you'll do it absolutely absolutely so do you remember what were your parents first reactions when they heard you singing for the first time stop <laughs> <laughs> the typical answer for a musician <laughs> don't do that like a lot of people still would react uh, please stop um <laughs> so nothing changed basically <laughs> nothing's changed um You know, they were really supportive. I think I, I I don't think they knew for a long time. You know, my my stepdad is he's a he's a Methodist minister. So you you know, you'd be in church and singing the hymnal, you know, singing from the hymnal and all that stuff, singing the hymns. So I would sing along, but I just assumed everybody could sing. I didn't really think much of it. I kind of took it for granted, to be totally honest. I thought I thought nothing of it. it. Wasn't until I did my first show. I was about 16 and we had this Battle of the Bands in Spokane. And the band I was in at the time, we each took one song. And so we opened the set with Rock and Roll by Led Zeppelin. Now, keep in mind, I hadn't hit puberty yet. Like, so my voice was high. Yeah. So it was really easy to sing that song for me. And I, But I didn't think anything of it. I was just like, oh, okay, I'll sing. And then I could play guitar. Cool. But I remember there was something about the reaction. And that's when I probably should have paid closer attention. Like, that there was just some pe- people were, seemed to, seemed to, re- to connect to a degree but I was just too oblivious to it and I just I like I said I kind of took it for granted and I wish I would have started cultivating it earlier because then I then I don't think I really started singing for about another six years you know like lead lead singing but yeah my parents were super supportive yeah last question any kind of advice that you would like to give to a young rock slash metal vocalist who is just about to start the journey anything that comes into your mind I think the advice I would give if you really love it and if it really Um, brings you joy, chase it down absolutely. No matter what anybody tells you, and I know that sounds like a, just a raging cliche, but it it is true. People are going to try to, you know, rain in your parade. But if it's something that um, brings you happiness, you got it. You got to chase it down. I and I and I would also advocate that if you do it, try and kind of understand your instrument, learn about how the voice works. You know, you only got two of these these two. Vo- little vocal folds they're fragile and when you're young you can do anything and it'll bounce back but keep in mind that you know you'll be uh, the years pass by quickly and you want to maintain your instrument so you know learn a little bit of technique just to help you know get you through and it'll help you with consistency and 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 it might actually make it so that when you're an old guy like me you might still have a voice <laughs> so so yeah I do I'm a I'm a firm believer in in um, learning a few things and 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 trying to trying to uh you know, facilitate consistency and, and a certain degree of effortlessness. Because that's, that's what it's all about, is just keeping it to uh, be getting to the point where you, 
you understand your instrument well enough where you can just be in that flow state and, and, and fully express and emote. That's what this is all about, is emoting. Thanks a lot for taking the time to do this. Thank you. Enjoyed it.